nine hundred dollar dues to buy us. Are you done? Great. Then let's cut the BS and get real. What? No. Nothing's going on around here. It's completely innocent. What I left accent me is that? Ring on the side Jamaican? Table. Aussies have a pretty distinct accent, and it's one that Hollywood finds hard to imitate. Imitate well, that is. Who do they think I am? Some stupid Aussie drongo? But every now and then we get something like this. Life is sharks. 100 million years ago when the dinosaurs lay dying, last thing they saw was sharks. Here's Liev Schreiber's own accent for comparison. To be an actor, or I guess to do anything in show business, the first thing you have to be willing to do is make a complete ass of yourself. Not that you did, Liev. So what makes the Aussie accent so hard to do properly? It is really challenging because it's similar to a lot of different accents. It has components of a lot of different accents, and I think that's where people get derailed. Letha McPherson is a dialect coach and the head of voice at the Victorian College of the Arts. I always quite, find it quite pleasing when I listen to um, accent tapes where one person is demonstrate, demonstrating 17 different accents, and you go, wow, impressive, 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 and they get to the Australian and you go, nah. <laughs> I've not met one American person that can do an Aussie accent. Most likely this one included. To understand the intricacies of the Aussie accent, we have to take a look at how it was born. The Australian accent started more than 200 years ago in January 1788, when the first European settlement landed. Aboriginal Australians were already here at the time, of course, but English was a foreign language to them. The first colonies of Australia mainly came from southeastern England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales. It was the children of these colonists who would have created the Australian accent. These children had their parents' accents, but also would have been influenced by the other children around them. By the 1830s, these different sounds caused a new and distinct accent to emerge. Even as late as the mid-1900s, you can still hear that British influence. But over time, those traits decreased as people embraced the Australian identity. Over a million live in Sydney, and another million in Melbourne. But perhaps the, uh, the nicest thing of all is this recent innovation by the commercial banking company of Sydney. It's a little card that brings you instant cash. We've been wandering up and down Little Collins Street now for about five minutes. And whilst a lot of people noticed I was carrying a gun, what was amazing was very few of them seemed concerned. As far as you're concerned, unless you're scripted, you're useless. Order. Unless you're scripted, you're Order. useless. Sorry, Mr Keating. Anyway, this constant change has evolved the accent into what we know today as Australian English. So why is it so hard for others to get right? I think it's because of that familiarity. So your brain will always, is always looking for patterns. It's always looking for things that it already knows. Take for example, Robert Kaczynski. He's a British actor playing an Australian character in Pacific Rim. You two are a goddamn disgrace. You're gonna get us all killed and here's the thing, Riley. I wanna come back from this mission. And it ends up sort of sounding sort of kind of a weird, quite a cockney sort of thing that people do. And you think, ah, that's what your brain is hearing. Your brain is hearing that pattern and then grouping it all together. Compared to something like this. You don't care about me. You don't even know me. Uh, there are therapies we know are effective right now, like for Scythia, and they don't even appear on the CDC website. Can you imagine the pain they must be in not knowing where I am? Now, before you get all defensive in the comments, know there is no one Australian accent. There are three general groupings of the accent, cultivated, broad, and general. Without spoiling, it ends with possibility. And here's this bloke from the bush up in Beerwa, Queensland. But nowadays, those definitions aren't really adequate as we've shifted towards a more general accent. A better way to group the accent would be standard Australian, Aboriginal English, and ethno-cultural Australian English. Sometimes we take those things for granted. Helen picked a good spot near the water and spent the morning surfing and relaxing in the sun. That last one reflects the fact that everyone has an idiolect. Your own accent is shaped by the history of where you've lived and who you've grown up with, so we all sound a bit different from each other. But there are plenty of common traits. And you learn over time in Australia to, to talk without moving your top lip. Because if you open your mouth, the flies go in. Maybe because he's a New Zealander, but that's not quite right. The back of the mouth at least should be really open. So you can feel like you're almost 
sitting on the edge of your seat, looking down a little bit, like you're feeling like you're looking over the edge of something. And that's going to lift your tongue up at the back and give you that warm kind of um, bright quality that that really distinguishes this accent. You, you don't hear a lot of Australians sort of talking like that. You don't hear that kind of dull, what we call a denasal sound. Australians are much more likely to have a level of nasality. If you're aware, we all go up at the end of every sentence. <laughs> because we're all too insecure to actually make a statement. So when people are actually making a statement, but they're actually going up in tune as they're talking to you, and uh, you, know, you may notice that quite a lot, but again, it doesn't happen everywhere. It's not um, a distinguishing characteristic, but it is a trait which American speakers, for example, would have to learn. And finally, uh, what was that last one again? The hesitation sound, which is a really really good way of figuring out how someone's mouth works in a different accent or language. Ah, that's it. So to know that that's where the Australian tongue rests is hugely helpful for like if I'm like for Scots, if I'm doing like a Scottish accent, I'm like that's their hesitation sound, which is really high and forward. M M takes a lot of effort for us, but that's where their tongue rests. So for them, them to just drop back to R ah, gives you a sense of the whole landscape that you're working with. And there are plenty of other common traits like our lack of enunciation and our sing-songy flow. But who knows, with technology connecting us to other cultures and ways of speaking, maybe in a hundred years we'll sound totally different. So it's interesting to see that maybe we might have more of an American influence coming in and less of a British influence. But where that takes us, ooh, I don't know, what an exciting journey. Hi there, thanks for watching. Before this video ends, it's important to mention that learning any accent is a difficult task. And sometimes actors aren't given enough time to learn an accent before a busy production period. So while they might have been able to do the accent offset, they weren't able to do it on set. Maybe. Or maybe they were really just bad.